actually, my talk is about neuro, uh, neurotrophin gene therapy for repair of spinal cord injury. And um, we basically, in the lab, are interested in uh, repairing the spinal cord after mechanical trauma. And <clears throat> to do so, we would like to attempt to look at how the brain uses the growth factors during development, both in directing the growth of the axons to elicit the growth of these neurons, and then to actually target them to specific locations. You can think about it as, as kind of like if you took all the parts to a computer and threw them onto the floor, they would remain as parts forever. The brain, however, is a computer that self-assembles itself. So all the neurons in your brain somehow, during development, know where to go, how and where to make the appropriate connections in order to establish the complex functional uh, and behavioral uh, uh, the behaviors that we have. So you can think of it as a, a, as a guidance principle in which these neurons have to figure out where they're going. So just like when you leave home, you have to navigate a very complex pathway in order to reach your destination. Now axons in the brain during development have to do the same thing. They start where, they're, they're, where the neuron was born, and then they send this long cytoplasmic process, which can be in the adult a meter long, but in the embryo is much, much shorter. These axons follow a very uh, uh, complicated pathway to reach their target where they then transfer and, and change from a growth state to a functional state and produce a synapse. Now, in order to do this, there are some stereotypic molecules. There's about 100 or so uh, guidance molecules and growth factors within the brain that uh, allow specific neurons to grow in the various complex patterns that they do. The uh, first set of molecules are known as chemoattractive molecules. These are molecules that attract the growth cone or the growing neuron to a particular target or an intermediate target uh, by forming a gradient. These are usually secreted molecules like neurotrophins um, that actually then uh, guide this neuron up a gradient to its target location. You also have uh, contact-mediated uh, attractors uh, such as extracellular matrix components like laminin or extracellular uh, or uh, uh, cell adhesion molecules like N-cadherin or N-cam. In that case, these molecules are provided on a surface, uh, a cellular surface or substrate, and the neuron will attach to that and follow that substrate just like a pathway um, to its target location. Now, on the other hand, you also want to keep some neurons out of specific territories. You want a neuron to grow in one direction, but you want it to stay out of other regions. So just like having chemoattractive factors that call the neuron to a particular target, you also have chemorepulsive factors like semaphorins. And these molecules are secreted by a target that will tell specific neurons to stay away from that target if they have the receptor that that particular chemorepulsive uh, molecule. And then you also have a series of molecules bound to a substrate known as contact inhibition. And some of these can be cell adhesion molecules, like, excuse me, uh, uh, extracellular matrix molecules, like chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, which develop and are secreted by astrocytes when they form a scar. Uh, during development, these set up barriers that restrict the growth of many axons within a territory. You also have selective morphogens like efferins and uh, other molecules like that, which actually can act as uh, um, repulsive type of cues as well. So what the neuron does is it will look at like uh, intermediate targets. So here's one intermediate target that's producing a chemotrophic factor that's calling this neuron or uh, attracting this neuron to this target. And then there's another second target down here which also acts as an intermediate target, but this tissue here is a non-target. So it's probably going to secrete a molecule that's repulsive to this growth cone. So this growing neuron will go from intermediate target one, avoid target two, uh, this target, go to intermediate target two before it reaches its final target domain in which it's going to create 
uh, its functional circuit. Now, after injury uh, in the adult nervous system, we have a number of complexities that render uh, many of, of these type of factors uh, important in uh, either the lack of growth or inducing regeneration. As you know, after a mechanical trauma to the spinal cord, you get a very large necrotic zone, which basically is the hallmark of where the gliosar will form. This is full of immune cells, and over time, it uh, produces the glial scar. Um, so um, the, uh, this lesion environment uh, produces a number of inhibitory molecules. It will produce the reactive astrocytes, will produ produce chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, which are uh, inhibitory to neurite growth. They produce no-go uh, from degenerating myelin, which was discussed earlier. Um, they also produce a lot of chemorepulsive factors that are traditionally known uh, during, for guidance during development. There's also something very interesting about the neurons related. Remember, uh, Dr. Greenberg talked earlier that there was scar and myelin that contribute to axon failure. Well, there's also the loss of the intrinsic growth capacity of the neurons themselves. So early on during development, neurons have signaling capacity that allows them to have a very strong growth program. As they mature, there are certain um, molecular pathways within the neurons which are reduced because the neuron, when it actually reaches its target, it forms a circuit. So its program, its genetic program is changing from one of growth to one of function, to one of processing information. What we need to do is in the adult is to get that program to switch back to a growth program. And since these neurons in the adult have this lower capacity to grow, we can artificially do that by either providing molecular, uh, molecular pathways that are involved in those growth pathways or by supplementing uh, the neuron with factors that are going to upregulate those growth proteins. And neurotrophins have, can do that. They can actually increase the intrinsic growth properties of these neurons. So not only do we have to worry about the scar formation and the inhibitory within the environment, but also the uh, inability of these neurons to elicit a growth program. Now, the other problem that we have within the central nervous system is that in the embryo, axons only have to grow a very short distance. For instance, for your voluntary motor control from your cortex to your spinal cord in a developing embryo, that distance is only maybe an inch. In the adult, that comes up to, that, that can be almost a meter long. So not only do these axons, not only are we, we requesting these axons to do something that they normally wouldn't do, and that is to change their growth to a growth program, but we need to have them grow an extremely long distance, a distance that they're not normally programmed to do. So we're looking at several types of models, and I'm only going to talk about two of the models that we're actually looking at uh, in order to induce regeneration. The first one is known as a brachial plexus injury or Ebb's palsy. And what occurs is in a fall or when a baby is born under breech conditions, if the arm is twisted back and rotated in such a way, you can tear the uh, roots or the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, roots that come, go into the spinal cord or come out of the spinal cord. We're interested in the sensory roots that go into the spinal cord. And when you, when you have these type of injuries, they produce a loss of function to the arm that has a very stereotypic type of uh, functional uh, uh, problem. And so the, the way this, this, uh, these, these uh, uh, brachial plexus injuries work is that they cause the roots that this is a would be a, this is the spinal cord. This is an illustration shows the spinal cord here, and then this is a peripheral root. And as Dr. Goldberg mentioned earlier, axons can regenerate in the peripheral uh, region of the peripheral, peripheral nervous system, um, and uh, the sensory neurons lie outside of the spinal cord within what is known as the dorsal root ganglion. And you have multiple sensory neurons. The red and green neurons here 
come into the spinal cord and they terminate in various distinct locations. Those are nociceptive axons. The red uh, illustrated neurons would be appropriate, uh, excuse me, would be uh, uh, peptinergic nociceptive axons, which terminate in the superficial dorsal region. And the green ones would represent non-peptinergic nociceptive axons. However, tactile information or information about the positioning of your limbs in space are represented by these blue neurons, which travel deeper into the spinal cord, where they can set up uh, uh, connections to uh, elicit reflex actions. So when, we, when you have an injury of this peripheral part, like, a, a, like a, analogous to the brachial plexus injuries, these axons are severed in this region. And they can grow and regenerate perfectly fine within the peripheral nerve. However, when they come in contact with the PNS-CNS transition zone, known as the dorsal root entry zone, they terminate their growth and fail to regenerate into the spinal cord where they would need to make their connections in order to re-elicit functional recovery. And many of the properties that are associated with the loss of this axon growth and the inability of these axons to regenerate back into the spinal cord are very similar to what we observe after a mechanical trauma to the, uh, the spinal cord. The difference being is that there is not a mechanical injury at this zone that would uh, impede or further impede the regeneration. So we can look at regeneration in this case in the absence of a scar. And what's else is nice about this approach is that these axons only need to regenerate a very short distance, a few millimeters back into the spinal cord in order to induce functional recovery that we can actually measure. And then we can look at the circuits and how these circuits are reformed after injury and regeneration. So in order to induce regeneration of various sensory subtypes, uh, we use, we're using neurotrophins. And these neurotrophins are secreted molecules that bind to specific receptors located on neurons. And different neuronal populations will express different subpopulations, different types of the receptors for these neurotrophins. For instance, in the sensory neurons that I discussed earlier, the peptinergic nociceptive axons primarily express what is known as TREC A, whereas TREC C is expressed on the large propiospinal axons, which determine uh, your uh, placement of your limb in space. There's also, there's multiple families of these neurotrophic factors. Another uh, family that we're interested in is a, is a GDNF family. And GDNF family functions slightly different. For uh, the neurotrophins, you have a direct interaction of the growth factor, which is in this case neurotrophin, to its receptor. But in the GDNF family, the neurotrophin or the neurotrophic factor will bind to an intermediate receptor known as a co-receptor. And then this complex binds to a single signal transduction receptor on the neuron to elicit the growth program in the neuron. And you can see that there are multiple uh, members of this family, and each one of these members has its unique um, co-receptor. So this, these, the, uh, they have to bind to their specific co-receptor to activate that signal transduction growth pathway. And for this GDNF family, we're interested in a particular neurotrophic factor called Artemin, which interacts only with the receptor, the co-receptor GR-alpha-3. So these neurotrophins elicit a growth enhancement in neurons by a number of pathways. This is a very complex slide, and I'm not going to quiz you on it later. Um, but it's just there to indicate various mechanisms by which these neurotrophins elicit growth. They activate a number of signaling components within the uh, neuron itself, which uh, increases the uh, what is known as the growth cone or growth tip on the neuron. Since the neuron has to find its target, it literally has to migrate and grow towards its target. So in order for it to grow towards its target, you need to have that migratory component of the nerve very active. Neurotrophins stimulate that ability of these growth cones to, uh, to migrate, to move, to seek out their target. They also influence uh, microtubule-associated proteins that are involved in increasing transport. Since 
most of the proteins that are involved in regeneration are made in the nucleus, you have to transport these proteins to the, the growth tip. And in many cases, that can be a very long distance. So these proteins that are made in the nucleus have to be transported to maintain the growth state. So these neurotrophins also enhance that process. And finally, the other things that they do is they change the transcriptional uh, programming in the neuron to get the neuron to upregulate genes that are involved in growth. And at the same time, influence mitochondria, which control the bioenergetic capacity of the neurons, little powerhouses, so that the neurons can uh, produce more genes um, that are involved in growth and it has the energy to do so. So in order to express these neurotrophins within the spinal cord and, and multiple uh, other molecules that we look at in our uh, various model systems, we use a process called gene therapy in which we use viruses as vehicles to transfer genetic information into both neurons and substrate cells within the spinal cord. This, uh, we use two different types of virus. We use a, a virus called a lentivirus or AAV, which is an endo-associated virus. Uh, these viruses basically have no viral genetic uh, uh, component, genetic component to them. Those are housed within separate vectors which do not get packed into this virus. So what we do is we use multiple vectors um, that contain various genetic information. These contain the packing information to make the virus itself, and then this vector is the vector that we have our gene of interest in. Now this vector has no viral encoding components to it. And this is the one that's packaged in the DNA of the virus itself. So the virus has basically no protein coding uh, capacity and therefore this virus cannot reproduce itself outside of the addition of these plasmids. Okay, so this is a virus that we only use as a transfer vehicle. And these are, uh, many of these types, both adenovirus, AAV, uh, adeno-associated virus, and lentivirus are FDA-approved uh, viruses for uh, transferring genetic material to um, uh, various cell types within, the, within uh, uh, the human. So our model uh, is a model of breakthroughs brachial plexus injury in which we're looking at, instead of using the cervical, the brachial plexus is mainly in the cervical region. Uh, we move down to the lumbar region in the rat because the dorsal roots are much longer and they're easier to manipulate without doing damage to the spinal cord itself. So we actually lesion four roots to create a fairly robust denervation of sensory information into the spinal cord. And basically, the hind limb of the animal uh, has no sensation. We then uh, go in and, within the spinal cord itself, inject our um, virus that has our gene of interest in it to see if this will elicit uh, axon growth within that territory. And then we can assess functional recovery and then evaluate uh, circuit reformation within the spinal cord. So this is just to show our expression data. So we've made a number of these viruses for various neurotrophins and various other compounds. And uh, we, can we see that uh, the viruses produce the appropriate protein. Uh, we can take virus, a control virus known as, uh, that contains a protein called green fluorescent protein, which is from a jellyfish. This is a, a, a fluorescent protein, and you can see the labeling of that. That's what we use for our control. And then we've looked at the expression in this, for this uh, study, for artemin, which is a GDNF family member neurotrophic factor, and then NGF uh, as well. And you can see very nice expression of these uh, proteins within the spinal cord. So then we allow the animals to recover for a certain period of time and we do, we look at regeneration. So if we overexpress our control uh, uh, vector within the spinal cord, this is the lesion side on your left. The right side is the control, sham control side. This, uh, we're staining here for a group of axons which are peptinergic nociceptive axons. 
And you can see that this is their standard, their typical uh, termination in normal uh, animals. If we overexpress our control uh, protein within the spinal cord, we get no regeneration of these uh, 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 CGRP positive axons. And actually, we get no regeneration of IB4 positive either. These are, uh, this is just uh, some uh, uh, background staining that's outside of the dorsal, uh, uh, dorsal horn that's mainly confined within the entry zone itself. Uh, if we overexpress artemin, we get, you can see that we get regeneration of the CGRP positive fibers, and they actually form a topographic organization that's very similar to the control site. And then we see some regeneration of IB4 positive non-peptinergic nociceptive axons. And then with NGF, nerve growth factor, we see very robust regeneration of these peptinergic nociceptive axons, but no regeneration of the non-peptinergic nociceptive axons. And like I said uh, earlier, these neurotrophins are specific for subpopulation of axons. Neither one of these, neither Artemin nor NGF, uh, will be uh, uh, influence uh, the large diameter neurons that are involved in touch or proprioceptive responses. And that's shown here by labeling with a uh, track tracer known as CTB or cholera uh, <coughs> toxin beta chain. Uh, normally, you have an innervation pattern that looks like this. Uh, these are motor neurons that have taken it up through the ventral root, but in the dorsal horn region, we get no re of sensory information uh, related to the large myelinated fibers. We are now looking at other factors to induce regeneration of these axons presently. So the other thing we want to verify is that if we're getting these axons to regenerate, do they target? Because targeting is very important for the elicitation of appropriate function. If the axons miss target, you could have detrimental, especially with nociceptive axons because they control pain mechanisms. And we're using this as a model to understand neuropathic pain as well. Um, but that's in a different set of studies that uh, are, um, don't have time to discuss. So when we lesion, if we don't lesion the animals, this is just to show the distribution of the uh, axons, uh, the CGRP positive axons within the dorsal horn. And you see that most of the axons are confined within this uh, lamina one and lamina two or upper superficial region of the dorsal horn. And in the normal animals, this decreases as you go deeper into the dorsal horn. So that in the deeper layers, six, five, four, and three, you see very little, if any, axons normally within those regions for, these, uh, for the CGRP positive group. If we overexpress NGF within uh, the dorsal horn, you can see that we get very extensive growth throughout the, all of these regions, which could produce aberrant behavioral outcomes. <laughs> If we overexpress artemin, we get a pattern that is very similar to that of the normal animal, indicating that artemin is inducing not only regeneration, but it's targeted regeneration. So when we look at functional recovery in these animals, and we look at thermal nociception, or the ability to the animal to remove its paw from a heat source, um, when we lesion the animals and overexpress our control protein, they don't recover. This is a one, that we do a ratio between a right and left paw. And uh, the ratio between a right and left paw should be one for a normal animal. But as you, when, with the lesion, the hind limb doesn't have any, uh, doesn't send sensory information back into the spinal cord. So the spinal cord doesn't detect, uh, doesn't relay that heat sensation up to the brain and the animal doesn't feel it and it doesn't remove its, its hind limb from the heat source. However, with the, when we overexpress uh, NGF or artemin, you can see that there's a return towards the baseline uh, uh, behavioral response, meaning that these animals now can sense the thermal nociception, can sense the uh, protective, uh, basically a pa the pain, and they can uh, respond to it in a protective manner. Um, and I said earlier, we don't, since we don't see regeneration of the large diameter axons, we don't get any response to tactile information or the ability of the animal to perceive where its limb is located in space. <laughs>
we're actually working on that in other studies. And then we, one of the other things we want to do is look at how these, uh, these regenerating axons, uh, what neurons they talk to within the spinal cord. And we can do that by staining uh, for a, what is known as an immediate early gene called CFOS. CFOS is expressed in the target neurons of the sensory uh, axons that regenerate, and we can identify them by this dark colored stain. And when we look at their location, we can determine where the regenerating axons are making their connections. So if we look at NGF, we see that we see these dots throughout the entire dorsal horn indicating that these neurons are making synaptic connections and influencing the neurons throughout, not only in the regions where they're supposed to, but in areas where they're not supposed to. Whereas when you overexpress uh, Artemin, we see this uh, communication limited to their uh, topographic uh, areas of origin. So one of the things that we're interested in is trying to find out why some of these molecules will target these locations. Why, why does Artemin target specifically to the appropriate location, whereas NGF causes this very robust uh, growth throughout the entire dorsal horn? And there's many reasons why this might be. Uh, one particular uh, uh, behavior or one particular uh, uh, influence of nerve growth factor is that nerve growth factor induces very high branching and sprouting of these neurons. Artemin is a very poor branching factor, and that might elicit some of the differences that we see. Um, so one of the things we wanted to look at was to see if we co-expressed NGF and Artemin, would NGF disrupt the ability of Artemin to target its appropriate location and then disrupt that targeting sense? The other thing we wanted to do is since we only expressed artemin in the spinal cord, remember artemin in order to activate its signal transduction mechanism and elicit growth in the neuron needs first to bind to GR-alpha-3 and that binding to GR-alpha-3 then will induce signal transduction in the neurons. So we wanted to see if we co-expressed artemin and GR-alpha-3 in the spinal cord, if this GR-alpha-3 if it's located in, in aberrant regions of the cord, if that would disrupt the topographic organization. And if we disrupt this, tar this topographic organization, what does that do to functional recovery? So when we overexpressed NGF within, uh, NGF and Artemin within the spinal cord, we very much disrupt the uh, ability of the targeting of the peptinergic nociceptive axons. And you can see that they grow into the deep dorsal horn. Where on the other hand, we didn't disrupt very much the uh, um, ability of the IB4 positive axons to target uh, within the spinal cord. And that's most likely due to the fact that these uh, neurons do not express the receptor uh, for NGF, so they do not recognize NGF as a growth molecule. The other thing that we did is we co-expressed artemin and GR-alpha-3 within the spinal cord. Uh, when we did that, we not only got disruption of the uh, uh, axons that, uh, the CGRP positive axons, which grew more diffuse within uh, the upper dorsal horn, but we had a distinct disruption of the IB4 positive nociceptive axons as well, and they grew uh, very much into the deeper dorsal lamina. And we had this stereotypic kind of, of, of streaking kind of, of patterning, which we saw in many animals. We still don't understand why that occurred, but it always winds up going towards the area around the central canal. And so what this shows is that with either NGF or the co-expression of artemin and NGF or artemin and GR-alpha-1, we can disrupt the normal targeting pattern of artemin and get these axons to grow into much deeper dorsal lamina and when we do that, we disrupt their behavior recovery. And now these animals don't just develop protective pain that brings it back to baseline, but they actually start developing signs of neuropathic pain, where the animals become hyperalgesic to, uh, to uh, 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 heat. And so when we disrupt the patterning mediated by artemin, uh, 
we move these animals then from having a protective mechanism of pain to a more neuropathic type of, of response. And we're studying these, these pain responses in much greater detail. And this is just to show that not only do we get disruption of the axon distribution, but also CFOS again uh, is distributed within the deeper dorsal lamina as well. So I'm going to make a little bit of a transition now, and uh, that was some of the work we're doing uh, with the dorsal rhizotomies and brachial plexus type of injuries. But we're very interested in looking at descending motor as well. And there's a very important voluntary motor tract within the central nervous system known as the cortical spinal tract. The cortical spinal tract neurons is a voluntary tract that basically uh, allows us to do all of our voluntary control movements. The neurons lie within the cortex itself, and these axons travel into the spinal cord. And what we want to do is we want to try to induce the growth of these axons past the scar, past the lesion site, to distal targets. Now, we might not get these axons to grow all the way down the spinal cord, but if we can get them to grow maybe one or two segments past the lesion site, for a person that has a, a, a cervical lesion, that could mean the difference between having no hand control and having some hand movement. So it would be a very important uh, increase in the quality of life for these individuals. So cortical spinal tracts have traditionally been very difficult to get to regenerate. As a matter of fact, it's considered the most difficult pathway in the in the central nervous system to regenerate. And there's been very, very, very few studies, matter of fact, there's only three studies that I can think of that convincingly show some regeneration of this cortical spinal tract. And uh, all three of those papers have used a knockout of a genetic mutation in a mouse that eliminates a protein called P10. And P10 is a negative regulator so it suppresses the activation of some growth factor signaling through what is known as an mTOR uh, pathway. Now, mTOR is a multifaceted path growth pathway that's involved in many, many different processes. But we're interested in a selective uh, uh, properties of this pathway, which influence uh, ribosomal uh, production and activation. Ribosomes are required for genetic information to be turned into proteins. Proteins are needed in order for that neuron to grow. So if you have good transcriptional mechanisms in which the neurotrophins can increase the genetic information, but the ribosomes cannot efficiently take that genetic information and make proteins out of it, they're not going to be very effective at eliciting growth. Um, so we want to enhance this capacity of our neurotrophin type of procedure in order to enhance the growth of these neurons. And to do so, instead of using this genetic deletion in, in a genetic mutant mouse, that's not very clinically relevant. You can't create knockout mutants in humans. Um, it's just, you just can't do it. So what we're doing is we're overexpressing a activator direct activator of this mTOR C1 complex. It's known as REB, okay? And this REB protein then turns this uh, mTOR on so that we can increase translation within our system. <coughs> and some of the data is shown here. mTOR is an interesting pathway because it's very highly activated during embryogenesis. When the brain is growing, you have the highest production of the uh, proteins that are involved in the mTOR pathway. And that's shown here by a labeling of a downstream uh, identifier of the mTOR pathway, which is known as uh, PS6 kinase. And that's shown in red here. And then uh, the green is staining for neurons in the cortex. Uh, during uh, early uh, postnatal development, when the cortex is sending, when the cortical spinal tract is sending its axons into the spinal cord, we have very high levels of expression of M uh, mTOR activation and this uh, PS6 kinase. However, in adults, 
if you were to stay in the adults, there's a dramatic decrease in the activation of this mTOR pathway. And after injury, it's decreased even further to where very, very few cells are um, showing activation of mTOR. So our, our procedure, uh, what we would like to do, what we're doing, is we're taking the uh, REB uh, AAV virus and we're injecting that into the cortex to activate these neurons within the cortex to increase their ability to uh, um, produce ribosomes, to uh, upregulate the activity of that mTOR pathway. And then we go in, we have to do this beforehand, before we lesion, unfortunately, in order to activate those systems. We then go into the spinal cord uh, 10 days later and we cut the spinal cord. Um, and at the time we cut the spinal cord, we inject another group of a, uh, adenal associated viruses that express a specific neurotrophin called NT3 and an enzyme which we got from uh, uh, Accorda uh, called chondroitinase. Chondroitinase dissolves an inhibitory molecule that's produced by glial scar formation. It's a very potent inhibitory molecule. And the enzyme chondroitinase dissolves those molecules to reduce the inhibitory quality of that scar. It doesn't completely eliminate it, but it reduces it. When we combine these therapies together, we, sus we, we uh, suspect that we will produce a, a increase in the ability of these neurons to elicit growth and a much more conducive growth environment around the injury site. And that should get axons to grow towards their distal target. So when we overexpress REB by itself within adult dorsal ganglion neurons and then stain those axons of those neurons, you can see that under control conditions or, or in the presence of our REB, we get larger neurons. The neurons grow much, much bigger. Um, and uh, they, when we quantify this data, we get about a two-fold increase in the growth of the neuron only in the presence of REB itself. And then this is shown by longer axons. The green and red bars here are the cells, that, the neurons that are expressing REB. And so they're shifted towards the right, which means that those neurons are much, much longer than our control neurons, which are shown in blue. If we take this REB uh, uh, AAV and inject it into the cortex of the adult uh, rats, we see a dramatic upregulation in the neurons production of this PS6 kinase, indicating that we've activated that mTOR pathway and then hopefully we'll be able to increase the translational capacity of those neurons. Um, when we do this in the animal and we lesion the spinal cord. And then here you can see the spinal cord lesion in our controls. These are animals in which the cortex was injected with uh, green fluorescent protein and so is the lesion site that we injected green fluorescent protein at the lesion site as well, uh, but you can't see it in this uh, uh, image. We, these are the cortical spinal tract axons that are labeled here in red. You can see that they grow near the lesion site, but they don't grow past the lesion site. However, if we were to express REB in the cortex and then NT3 distal to the lesion site, so here's a lesion site, and often when you lesion the spinal cord in rats, you not only get glial scar formation, but you get these cavities that form. These are cavitational cysts, or they're basically fluid-filled cysts that occur. And you can see that these cortical spinal tract axons under this condition grow all the way up to the lesion site. And you can actually follow some of these axons through the injury site itself and then into the uh, distal uh, spinal cord. And that is shown here where we, we've quantified some of that data so far. This is, we've only done one cohort of animals. We're in the process of doing a second cohort in which we're going to also do behavioral uh, um, evaluations of forelimb motor recovery and we use very complicated uh, forelimb behavioral reaching and grasping tasks. <laughs>
And so, but for regeneration purposes, we see within the presence of Reb, NT3, and then our congruent sulfate proteoglycan, we see a very dramatic increase in the amount of axon regenerated compared to our controls. So in conclusion, um, I would just like to uh, say that for sensory regeneration, we have analyzed uh, NGF and Artemin, and we find that they have the capacity to promote functional regeneration of small diameter nociceptive axons. And if we mistarget that, um, those connections, either by overexpressing NGF or GR alpha 3 with the artemin, this leads to the development of neuropathic pain in these animals as determined by thermal hyperalgesia. Um, if we, uh, for cortical spinal tract or central nervous system axons, in order to enhance their regeneration, we're looking at manipulating not only the environmental responses, but also the growth status of the neuron itself by activating the mTOR pathway. There's another second pathway that we're very interested in as well. It's called BRAF pathway, but I'm not going to get into that, which also is reduced dramatically uh, with uh, age as well, so that in the development, it's very highly regulated, but Postnatally, it's downregulated, and we believe that that would also enhance the growth of these neurons. Um, and let's see, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people who did the work. Uh, Ying Pong Lu did the cortical spinal tract uh, work, uh, looking at, uh, he made all the REB constructs and NT3 constructs. Uh, Zhao Chi Tang and Lakshmi did the uh, dorsal rhizotomy work, and uh, they developed all the vectors involved in that. I also like to uh, thank the funding institutions, NIH, which provided us with a, uh, most of our funds uh, for doing these studies, uh, the Kentucky Spinal Cord and Hen Injury Research Trust, and also the Shriners Hospital for Pediatric Research, uh, which presently provides us with a lot of funds. Thank you very much.